and in the Easter week, we always have it on Easter day, so we're going to have communion here just in a little while at the end of the service. Uh, I want to do a correction. Uh, last week I said that the reason Jesus was able to have the uh, Passover meal with his disciples on Thursday is because there was a... Uh, John MacArthur teaches that there was some, tra some traditions had it on Thursday and some on what was the right day, which is a Good Friday. This is always on Friday. Some today even think it's uh, Thursday. But that's wrong. It's always on Friday. And I kind of drift away because I've done some study. I've done some more study between last week and, and this week and uh, into the subject. And I, I'm not sure. I'm going to just depart from... from uh, from uh, John MacArthur just a little bit because I don't believe that Jesus, if Jesus were having the Passover meal because the lamb represents the body of Christ. That's what it represents, right? So why would he have taken bread and broke it and given it to his disciples? Why wouldn't he have taken a lamb, a piece of lamb, and just broke off pieces of that and give it to his disciples? Because that's his body. I think it's because it's the Passover week, not just the Passover day. Friday is the day of preparation, which is taking the, the, the lamb that, that you had, that, that that family's head in the household, took the lamb into the household, bought a, a lamb, or, or, and they had to inspect it. By law, they had to inspect it for four days, make sure it was without spot and that it was not sickly or anything like that, and then they could present it for, for sacrifice on Friday. But I believe it was a meal that, they, that Jesus was having with his disciples, but it was the leavened bread meal. It was the leavened bread. And, and I, I believe that they did that on every day of, the, of, the, uh, of Holy Week. Each day they had an a, uh, unleavened bread meal. And that's what he was celebrating. That's why it said that he took the bread and he broke it instead of a lamb. Amen. And besides that, Jesus would not break the law. He, his life, was, his whole life was about keeping the law. He had no sin. He was perfect. Amen? So this, this uh, we're taking up, and I told you I wanted to save Good Friday, and so we, we're going to be talking about today, Good Friday, which is the day of preparation, and then the Sabbath, Saturday, and then Sunday, Resurrection Day. The first day of the week. Amen. 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 I chose the title of today's message to be Glorious Day. And I chose it, I, I've, I'm using the song, the, the chorus in the song, Oh Glorious Day. I'm using that title in my, for my outline. Amen. If you don't know how the song goes, the, the, uh, the uh, chorus says that uh, living, he, living He loved me, dying He, he saved, saved me, me. buried He, he carried, carried my, my sins, sins far away, away. rising He justified right. freely forever, right. and one day He's coming, coming. oh glorious, glorious day. day. Amen. Amen. I'm using three of those because it's a three-part message. And Living, number one, living, He loved us. Number two, dying, He saved us. And number three, rising, He justified us. Let's take the first one. Living, He loved us. The sole purpose for Christ's existence was to go to that cross for our sins. Was to pave a way Make a, a way for us to, to have access to the Father. There was only through a high priest before. His whole existence is because God has so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Everything He did was because He loves us. Amen? So His life it represents 
Him loving us. After Jesus had over the, the Passover meal and he, and he predicted his, uh, his betrayal, he, he also predicted that Peter would deny him three times before the cock crowed that night. And it was the evening time, and it was dark. And uh, Jesus went with his disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And in Matthew 26, 36 through 46, it says that uh, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to, to, to be sorrowful, about, sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed by sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not, as, not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them asleep. Could you not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and, and pray that you do not uh, fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My Father, if it is not, your, uh, not possible for me to for this cup to pass uh, to be taken for, away from uh, away unless I drink of it, drink it. May your will be done. When he came back, he again found his found them sleeping because their eyes were were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them. Are you, still asleep? Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is, is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into, his, into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And what he's referring to there is that Judas had concocted a plan with the religious leaders that uh, he would go, they had clubs, they, had, they were swords, and they had a, a, a several men armed ready to abduct Jesus. And Peter, and uh, Judas Iscariot said, I'll go down there, and the one you see me kiss, then, you, then arrest him. That's who he is. Now I want to go back here just for a second. Jesus, uh, 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 one of the other guys, I think it was Luke, but I'm not 100% sure, says that uh, when Jesus was praying, that he was sweating blood. He was sweating blood. He was agonizing in his prayer. You see, it's not God the Father, it's not Jesus, the, the Son of God, that's troubled. It's Jesus, the Son of Man, that is troubled. Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. And he experienced the, the fallibilities of, of the human body just like we do. It says, that, uh, it says right here, going a little further, he fell. No, 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 let me back back there. Verse, 30, verse 38. Then he said to them, My, my soul is overwhelmed my, with sorrow to the point of death. Have you ever been overcome with sorrow to the point that you said, man, I've just seen die I have to go through all this. You ever been there? Jesus was there. The human part of him was there. The God part of him, the deity, the Son of God, what are you talking about? He has always known that he's facing this. How would you like to know what your death was going to be like, how it was going to be experienced? And, and furthermore, that you are going to suffer an agonizing death. But you knew everything about it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're the Son of God, no problem. You can take anything. Mm -hmm. But the Son of Man, the man in you, the human in you, 
Not so. Nobody wants that. But he was agonizing over that to the point of death. Said the first time he went back, he said, can't you, he said, can't you, couldn't you have stayed away for an hour at least? Mm -hmm. There was a lot more that Jesus prayed other than just, Lord, if, if it's possible, let this cup pass me three times. He can go through that pretty quick. You know, I pray in the morning, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. And that's a long time to pray. But he prayed for three hours at least. Three hours. So I wonder what else he prayed along that time. I think the answer is found in John chapter 17. John doesn't mention the Garden of Gethsemane. But right after chapter 17, beginning in verse in, in, in chapter 18, he says, when he had finished praying, Jesus left them, left, his, left, left with his disciples and crossed to the kingdom. That's when he was betrayed. So when he, let, when he finished praying here in John chapter 17, then he was betrayed, which is the same thing that happened in Matthew chapter uh, 26. That he was, that uh, in the garden of Gethsemane, he was betrayed with the kids in the dead of night. The first thing it, that he, that, uh, John chapter 17 says is that Jesus prayed for himself. And that makes sense because he said, Lord, this, uh, if it's possible, let this cup pass me. He said that each time. But then, when he came back, when he went back the second time, he prayed for his disciples, which is verses verse 6 through 19. But then he prayed for us. Amen. Let's read what he said about us, beginning in verse 20. My prayer is not for them, them alone, meaning his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as, as you are in me and I am in you. May they also in, be in us, that the world may believe that they, that they have sent that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that, that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them, and you and me. May they be brought brought to may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them, even as I even if you have loved me. Father, I want those who uh, those you you have given me to be with uh, to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you get, you get, you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you that you that you sent you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in in order to in order that the love you you have for me may be in in them, and that I myself may be in them. I believe. It's biology, but I think that the evidence is here is that this is what Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. In your leisure, going back, I, I, I suggest that you read these prayers because they're from our Lord. Amen? But that just shows His love for us because living, He loved us. And in dying, he saved us. Look at Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to say this, though, uh, before I... After Judas, Judas Iscariot came to... Uh, came in the Garden of Gethsemane with, the, with all the, the horde of guards and soldiers and things of that nature that would, get, would come to arrest him. 
after he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. Uh, it says one of the disciples even cut off one of the ears of the of the people of the uh, the servants of the of the high priest, one of the high priests. And y'all know that story. Jesus put his hand on mm -hmm. on the man where the ear used to be and healed it, and uh, he had an ear again. Even in the midst of knowing what he was going to be going through, but see, he was he knew it was his it was his destiny to be given over to them for sacrifice. And then they uh, they took him to. They took him to uh, to the Sanhedrin and arranged for arraignment. And then from there, and they also also during all of this is when Peter denied him three times. That happened. And then they took him before Pilate because they wanted to have him crucified. Interesting enough, interestingly enough, the Bible says that they went to Pilate's house with Jesus. This is after he'd already been beating and stuff. Because they were, they beat him and said, prophesy who hit you. All that kind of stuff. In fact, one of the Gospels say that uh, when Jesus, uh, they had, when the, the high priests were, were questioning him about what he had said, he said, man, I've been in the synagogues talking, preaching. Anything I've said, I've not held that. I've not said anything in secret. If you don't know what I said, ask the people I spoke, that I preached to. And somebody hit him in the head, upside the head, and told sit one of the one of the official one of the officials hit him in the side of the head and said, Don't you know who you're talking to? This is a high priest. Isn't that ironic? You're talking to the high priest, wanting them to wanting to uh, uh, listen and, and, and treat with respect. These high priests, which were just, I mean, just as he said, woe to you Pharisees. Outward you're like a, like a whitewashed tombs, but inside you're rotting bones. And that's the people he was, they were saying that he needed to respect. Jesus was very respectful. Because then he told that guy, he asked that guy, tell me what I said wrong. And I said, I was wrong. So why did you hit me then? But he went off and they took him to Pilate after that because they wanted to, to have him crucified. That's what they wanted. They wanted him crucified. The people, the only way that he could be crucified is if, if Pilate said that he had to be crucified. He's the one with the authority to do so. The, uh, the, the Jews didn't have the authority to crucify anybody. It was the Roman soldiers. It was the Roman government, which was Pilate. Then they told Pilate, because Pilate said, man, I questioned him, because he, he questioned old Jesus, and Jesus said, yeah, that, I'm, I'm the king of the Jews. I am. That didn't make any difference to Pilate. Pilate said, man, I don't see a reason to, to, to put this, this, this guy to death. I don't see any fault in him. So then they said that he's from Galilee. He said, wait a minute, you said he's from Galilee, so he sent him to Herod. And Herod, he just wanted to see him perform mm -hmm. miracles and stuff in front of Jesus. Just silent, mm -hmm. didn't say a thing to him. And he didn't find uh, grounds for it either, mm -hmm. for him to, to be crucified or anything like that, to be put to death. So they brought him back, and they said, crucify him! Crucify him! He said, well, listen, uh, it's our custom that on the Passover, the day of preparation, that on, on the Passover, that, I would, that we will uh, uh, commute the sentence of one, we will release one prisoner. One of the prisoners. And that's when they said, Give us Barabbas, the murderer. Crucify Jesus. So then Pilate gave Jesus over to the Roman soldiers to be tortured, to be beaten with the cat of nine tails. The throne, and when they when they got him in there, uh, the soldiers did. They mm -hmm. they took his clothes off. They they put a, a a purple robe on him. They made a crown out of thorns. Much like this one, 
One of our elders made this for us. It's made out of locust thorns. And if you look at the locust thorn, that I'm going to pass it around so you can see it. The locust thorn is the cross. But they fashioned this crown, <coughs> mocking him, saying that he is the king of the Jews, because that's who he said he was. I'm going to pass it around and let you go. Be careful, because if you don't know anything about locust, you don't want to see it? Mm. Locust thorn? Oh, man, they will... Ooh, it hurts when they when they poke you. It hurts. I think you got a little poison on the end of it. But I want you to think about that crown that's being passed around. It was shoved down in his head, all the way to his skull. the The blood was just oozing down his face and and down onto his shoulders from that crown. His back was turned into ribbons. Not just his back, but his front too. Mel Gibson, I think he had the best uh, rendition of, of what happened. Actually, Mel Gibson in, in The Passion of the Christ. On that cobblestone, uh, I, I forget what it's called, uh, where they, they, they would tie, they would chain their, their victims to a whipping post. And they gave him the 39 lashes. Well, about half of those lashes, they turned him over and beat the front of him. Because it's not just his back, but the front of him is cut into ribbons as well. So they turned him over to be crucified. And then I want to talk about his death. Because dying, he saves us. His death is, the scriptures I want to use is, is, is Matthew again, chapter 27, verses 45 through 53. This is after they have nailed him to the cross. And he's hanging there between two thieves. One of the thieves, he's already told him that he'd be in paradise with him. The other one's going to die. Verse 45 says this, From the sixth hour until the ninth, that ninth hour, darkness came over the whole land. This wasn't, I've heard people say, well, this is the lunar, this is the solar eclipse. I don't believe it was a solar eclipse. I believe it was the darkness of evil and sin is what it was. Yeah. At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there saying they heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and, and, and got a sponge. He filled it with, with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and he offered it to Jesus to drink. Then the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes and saves him. He comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, and what he cried out then is that it is finished. He gave up the spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of, of many holy people who had died was raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Wouldn't that be a sight? Wouldn't that be a sight? At least a thousand years before this, King David wrote a song. And it's it it Psalm 22. It is a song, that, a song of David. In fact, it says it's to, to be sang to the tune of the doe of the morning. And the first verse says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Word for word, what Jesus said on that cross. Amen? 
verses seven and eight. All who all who seek uh, all who seek me all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him let him uh, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Verse fourteen through sixteen. 18, excuse me, 14 through 18. It says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. And God did that. God put all of the sin of the world on His Son. We don't have the power to do that. God does. And He did. Verse 16, Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count my, all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. I think that a lot of this was a little bit in reverse order as to how it, it actually happened. I, I chose those verses because they speak of the crucifixion and what happened. But he said, now, now I want to go, I want to go back to. Well, let me say this first before I move on. It says in verse 14, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. The, Roman, the Romans were good at their job. They wanted to make sure that they could, uh, they could make their, who was their crucifying suffer as much as they could. So the cross that they nailed Jesus to. Guys, it wasn't just, all, hey, you, you hold his hand and I'm going to drive some nails through it and then through his feet. Oh, it was way more brutal than that. Amen. I could see those Roman soldiers putting their, putting their feet up against the cross members over here because the holes were already probably in the cross. So they had to stretch you out to where the holes are. But that was purposeful. Because they wanted to pull your arms out of socket in order to do that. My bones are out of joint, he said. You see, because the reason they did that is because they didn't want them to be able to pull up with their arms in order to get a breath. Because the purpose of the cross was a slow suffoca suffocation. They drove nails into their feet. And the only way they could draw breath was to push up against that, that, those, that nail, that spike. And that shot a radiating, agonizing pain through their whole body every time they raised up to get a breath. That's what he was going to. Amen? So that I can count my bones. As I mentioned, they, his front of his body was ripped to ribbons all the way down to his bones. He could count his ribs. He could see his ribs. We could see his ribs. Guys, let me tell you something. I, I was going to bring my hammer and the nail so I could give you the sound effects of the hammer. Every one of those pains was mine. I, my sin drove every nail into him. My sin was every cat of nine tails hitting his back and ripping his flesh off. So is yours. Amen? That was the payment that we deserved that He took upon Himself for our sins because He loved us that much. Amen. Now go back. Well, I want to mention one other thing. Before I move completely back over to Matthew. 
It says in verse 14 also, my heart, the last part of verse 14, my heart is turned to wax. It is melted away within me. There is a phenomenon known as the broken heart syndrome. It is a, it's what happens to a heart that is, that is had like an overwhelming amount of stress. And the heart literally ruptures inside the body. And there is a pleural cavity that surrounds our heart with water. And when that ruptured, that blood mixes with that water. While Jesus was hanging on that cross, he had already given up the ghost. The Roman soldiers, because the high priest said we can't have anybody hanging on the cross for Sabbath, that'd be a sin. So they went to Pilate, and Pilate gave the, gave the order to have the legs of the, of the people broken that were hanging on the cross so that they would go ahead and suffocate. They could no longer push up and get their breath. They would go ahead and suffocate and die. But when the soldier, and let me say this, that, that Jesus was a perfect sacrifice. He had no broken bone in his body. You know, that's one thing that Jesus didn't uh, experience that we did, most of us do. How many of us have had a broken bone in their life? Mm -hmm. Not everybody has. Never did. Jesus never had a broken bone. He was a perfect sacrifice. Amen. So there was no way that he was going to be, his legs were going to be broken. He wouldn't have been a perfect sacrifice. So when that Roman soldier came up and was about to break his legs, he saw that it looked like Jesus was dead because he had already given up the ghost. So he stuck the spear right up to his side into that pearl cavity and out came that blood and water, the Bible says. It overflowed, it gushed out. That is proof positive. Guys, it wasn't the weight of the sin on his world because Jesus, man, the, 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 the God, he can handle that. It wasn't the, the being tortured that put so much pressure on him. But it was all of the sin of the world, all of it, one time being put on him. And it caused his heart to rupture inside of him, the man part of it. It's too much to take. Do you know what that means? It means that Jesus died of a broken heart for you and for me. Amen. That's what it means. Amen. He still loved us so much, even in death. The way he died was broken hearted for us. And going back to Matthew, he said from the sixth hour on until the, till the ninth, darkness came over the land. As I mentioned, I, think, I don't think it was an eclipse, solar eclipse. It just seemed to be that God planned it right for that to happen. No. The sun was blocked out and it was dark. But I believe it was the sin of the world that that moment that was coming on Jesus and all came on his shoulders. And so much so that the Bible says that he became sin. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, God had to forsake him. He could not look at his son any longer because he was sin. Our sin was on him. And he gave up the ghost. You know, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. His body went into the tomb. But Jesus wasn't there. He wasn't in the body anymore. He left the body when he died on that cross. Amen. So where did he go? Galatians. No, sorry, Ephesians. Is Ephesians 4. Seven through ten. But to each one of us, one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended, 
on high. He led captives in his train. All of those who were raised up and were uh, resurrected that day, when Jesus went into heaven, they were right behind him in his train and gave gifts to men. It's a gift of salvation. Amen? Amen. Verse 9. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who, is, who descended is the same is the very one who ascended higher than, than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So, Apostle Paul is saying, and other parts of the Bible says this too, that Jesus went into hell. If we die in our sins, where do, they, where do we go? Of course you go to hell. Have you ever wondered what Jesus did with all that sin that was on him? I have. I can never get rid of my sin. I don't have that power. But Jesus, having all of that sin on him, he went into the pit of hell. Now this isn't just hell's fire. This is also, this is Sheol. The Bible calls it Sheol. Sheol is a, is a place where you, on one side you have to, uh, uh, an area of torment. Torture, just torment. In hell's fire. And it's, there's a great divide that, that, uh, that, that uh, divides another re region, two re different regions. Another one is called Abraham's bosom or the, or the uh, Abraham's rest. That's where people are resting. They're at peace. Jesus did two things, I believe. First, he, he set those captives free. And who those captives were, not, I'll say captives, they were everyone who had, had for atonement for their sins through animal sacrifice, the law of, uh, of Moses. They were in that resting place. And they were waiting for Jesus to set them free, and that's what he was there to do. But he also took the sins that he had on top of him and he put them in hell where they belong. Exactly. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that our sins are as far away as the east is from the west when we call upon Jesus. We ask him to come into our hearts. They're as far away as the east is from the west because we'll never see them again. We have the promise of the Holy Spirit that we're going to be in heaven. There is no sin in heaven. Sin is where it belongs in hell. God's math is really cool. Spiritual math. If you're born once, you're going to die twice. If you're born into this world and you don't and you're not born again, you're going to die twice. All of us are going to die. But if you're born one time and you don't accept Christ, which is being born again, then you will experience the second death that the Bible speaks about in the book of Revelations, the great white throne judgment. It's the second death. It's an eternal separation from God. God brings all of us to His Son, and we can either say yes or no. Amen? If we say yes to God, our sins as far away as the east is from the They're right down in hell where we can't ever get to them. We'll never see them again. But if you experience that second death, then you're going to go down to hell right where your sins have been waiting for you. Amen? That's how he did it. That's how he did it. Dying, He saved us. And He carried our sins far away. Amen. He was buried in that tomb on Friday evening. And he was there all day Saturday, the Sabbath. And then Sunday morning, He went back into His body and, and, and rose Himself back from the, up from the dead with a new resurrected body. And that's what we celebrate today. Because rising, He justifies us. Living, He loved us. Dying, He saved us. 
in rising, he justifies us. Again, in Matthew chapter 28 now. Verses 1 through 6. Jesus came back into his body sometime. We don't know exactly when. But he, poof, came out of that. His, I mean, just out of the tomb. Out of the tomb. And there was a, a stone that was there. But Jesus came back into his body, a new resurrected body, and he teleported out of that tomb. That wasn't the first time he teleported. When he appeared out of nowhere with the disciples, we told him in Galilee, we told him to go and he would he would come to them. He did the same thing. The Bible says in Matthew twenty eight, verse one. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to, went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. And going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like them. They fainted. They fainted. And the angel said, uh, said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, Come and see the place where he lay. You know, he, Mary, the two Marys left the tomb because Jesus instructed them to go tell the disciples to go to Galilee where he would meet them. And Jesus, uh, not the angel, and uh, Jesus appeared to, to them. Man, they were excited. They went, first, they went down to just like me and you would, groveling at his feet. Don't say you wouldn't. You know you would. You wouldn't have any choice. You'd see this how unpure you are in the presence of God Almighty. You are going to your knees at His feet. Every knee will bow. Mm -mm. Jesus told them to go tell the disciples. Then they no. saw Peter and John. Peter and John. Peter and John on the road. And they didn't believe them. But then He said to said, let's go see. Let's go check this out and go see it. So that is a dead run, man. They were hooking him. The Bible says that John outran Peter. And he got to the tomb, to the tomb and he stopped and he looked and he was just looking around in there just real cautious. See, what is in the tomb? I want to make sure something don't get out and snag me or something. But uh, Peter, man, he's out of breath. Here he comes lagging behind. But he stays in a full run straight into that tomb, man. I got to see this. Is my Lord in there or not? No, he's not in there. He's risen. Later on, he did appear to the disciples. We know all of those stories. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 through 16. 15 and 16 says this. Paul says this. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that, the, that, know that a man is not justified by observing the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in, Jesus, in, in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by, by observing the law, no one will be justified. So rising justified us.
Here's what justified means. It's just if I'd, just if I'd never sinned. And why is that? Because your sins are in hell. So far away, you'll never see them. But you're not going to hell. You're going to heaven. That's why he can say, that, that's why it's hard for us to understand that. You know, he might tell me, well, Pastor Bob, what about future sins? You know, we accepted Christ at one time, and he forgave us of our sins, but what about the future sins? Guys, there's only two sins, past and future. Past sins are those that happened before Christ died on that cross. All other sin is future sin. Amen? Don't get caught up on the semantics. Christ died to pay for your sins. All of them. And they're not here. They have no power over you because they're in hell. Do not pass, be judged for your sins in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 1 says, there, Therefore, there is now no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because he took your sins and cast them into the pit of hell. Amen? And it's just as if you had never sinned. Just if I'd never. Just if I'd never sinned. Amen? So living. He loved us. Dying, He saved us. And rising, He justified us. But there's some more good news. One day He's coming back. Oh, glorious day is that going to be, right? And to that we say, come quickly, Lord. Come quickly. I mentioned, as I said here uh, today, I've, I've mentioned, and, and the, the, the salvation message is all in the Scriptures today. All in the sermon today. Amen. If it is left up to us, we will never come to God. Never come to God. Apostle Paul in, said in Romans chapter 3 that there is no one there was no one. Uh, I'm going to have to read it, I guess. <laughs> there was no one righteous, not even one. That's what it says. All have sinned and fall short of His glory. There was no one who comes... I mean, I've got it right here. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. We don't seek God. Here I go again. At, when I get when we get in our new church, I'm gonna build a bigger podium. Yeah. <laughs> At least I didn't build. Yeah, I did get on my Bible. But but it says, Apostle Paul said that the that number's gonna come to Christ. All have fall short, fallen short of His glory. And the wages for our sins is what exactly, exactly what Christ took going up to and the cross. The suffering. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Ephesians 4 says that the gifts for men, that's the gift. Eternal life. I can't think of a more honorable day to ask Christ into your heart than today. Because today represents the very moment that Christ connected all the dots. He, he, he became salvation for us. He is God's Lamb, His perfect Lamb for us. Thank you. My Bible's been through the ringer.
takes us all to the point where He draws us to His Son. He calls us all to salvation. We all have a destiny to be saved. But we have to make that choice. God's not going to make it for us. He is not willing that any should perish, but all should find a salvation in His Son. That's His perfect will. His accepted will is that not all are going to. Unfortunately, more are not than do. Jesus said that the that, that the uh, broad is the way and, and, and broad is the is the is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many find it. That means a whole lot of people are going to be reunited with their sin. But if you choose the narrow way the narrow gate, the narrow way, few find it, it leads to eternal life. That's a reunion in heaven. You're going to be reunited with, with Christ and God and, and all of your loved ones. It's going to be a big old family reunion. But if you say no, then you're going to be reunited with the sins in hell, your sins in hell. That's going to be your reunion. I want to give you an opportunity to ask Christ into your heart here today. God said, I mean, Jesus said that no one comes to me unless the Father draws them. That's what I'm talking about. We all have a destiny of salvation. But it's our choice. I know how it happened with me that God was working on me. Boy, my head is dirty. <laughs> how it happened with me is that God he chased me till I called him and he did you too if you're saved he chased you till you called him you weren't going to come to him he came to you and he drew you to his son he did that for me in 1983 Rockwell, Texas Bethany Baptist Church I went forward in that congregation up to the front of that church and got down on my knees and I asked Christ to come into my heart. And He saved me. Amen. If you want to ask Christ into your heart, you can do it right where you're sitting. Well, first of all, I've started doing this. I'm going to continue to do it. I'm going to pray that God would draw that person He's been working on to His Son. And if you feel that draw when I pray this, then say the prayer of salvation right after that. Father God, I love you so, so very much. Father, at this very moment, I'm asking that you would draw that person that you've been working on, that person that you have been conditioning, tilling up the soil of their heart, getting it ready, fertile ground for your salvation. Father, I'm, at this moment, I'm asking that you would draw them to your son at this very moment. If you felt that draw, say this prayer and mean it from your heart. Just admit to him, Lord, I, I know I'm a sinner. Right now, I turn from that sinful life. I agree, Lord, that you are right and that I am wrong. I want to do things your way. 
So Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart now. I receive you by faith into my spirit. I believe you died on that cross for my sins. That you rose back to life. You're living in me now. I recognize you as my God, my Lord, and my friend. And from this moment forward, I will serve only you. In Jesus' precious, precious name. I said that prayer for the first time. More importantly than that, that you felt that emptiness that you had begin to be filled when you prayed that prayer. If you're here in the church, I need to see you right at the services. And if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, my telephone number's right here. Or you can go on the Facebook page if you're watching there at the Blue Bar. and bring up my information. Or Rector J. Cowboy Church website and bring up my contact information as well. That is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And it is dire that I'll talk to you about that, about your decision, about your commitment. And by the way, if you die once, if you're born once, you die twice. But if you're born twice, you die once. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Uh, the month of of Easter of the Passover, we always have communion because Jesus connected the dots in the upper room, and He. Surely connected to dots when he died for our sins. Amen. When he became the Passover lamb. And so we're going to have communion now. Let me get my Bible again. play that music again. While this music plays, one of the things that, uh, and I didn't say this, let me go back in today's message just for a second, when, uh, when the Pharisees went before Pilate, they didn't go in his house. And the reason they didn't is because there was leaven in his house. They were instructed for five days to have no sin, no, no leaven, no yeast inside the house or outside their house. And they were afraid it would disqualify them for the rest of the Passover ceremonies if they went in Herod's house. That's sickening. But in keeping that, this is the Passover that we're celebrating right now. It is important that we get the yeast out of this house inside and out. And how we do that, because yeast represents sin. How we do that is we ask God to search us. And we ask Him to forgive us of our sins before we partake of His body and His blood. So, while this plays, don't you pray individually and ask God to search your heart forgive you of your sins and forgive those who have sinned against you. Amen. And forgive those you've sinned against.
Bible says in Matthew 26, 26, this is the upper room again. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he offered to them, to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood, which is, uh, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Father, we love you so, so very much. Lord, we pray that this, what we have done here today, pleases you. Our desire is to bring glory to you, glory to your name. We thank you for giving your son for us. We thank you that from the beginning of this world, it's always been your plan to come down to this earth, live a sinless life because of your love for us to die on that cross for our sins and take the sin debt that we owe upon yourself. And we thank you so much for that. Lord, at least for this brief moment in time, we are right with you. And I know that Lord, we're going to go out into the world and we're going to be faced with many trials and temptations. Lord, I I ask that you pray for us like you did in Gethsemane to shield us from this harsh, harsh world. But Lord, I know we must be doers of your word, not hearers only. So Lord, I'm asking that you to show us how to take these things that we're learning, apply them to our lives so that we can be light to this otherwise dark world, so that we can be ambassadors for both sinner and saint for you here on this or in this world. But we remind ourselves that this is not our home. You are our home. And we're far away from it at this at this time. But we know we must go along, go on in this world until you come back. Or until you take us from this world. So, Lord, just uh, until we can get back up here for next Sunday, Lord, I ask for your protection. I ask for your grace, your mercy, your love. I ask for your perfect speed and your favor in our lives. And we can come back next Sunday and, Lord, we can talk about you again. We can praise you again. We can get excited again. But we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God, we love you. See you next week.